Welcome to Lunch with the League. I'm Lori Thiel, President, League of Women Voters of San Diego. Those of you who have joined us for these events in the past know that this is the time during the luncheon that we would normally be sharing a meal together and reconnecting with old friends and making some new ones. But today we're coming to you via webinar due to the social distancing requirements imposed because of the coronavirus pandemic. So I'd like to start this luncheon with a special thank you to Jeff Wargalis and Allison Ross from the ACLU. They have generously shared with us their video conferencing account and importantly, they have trained our team on how to use it so that we can bring this program to you today. Future programs will also be conducted via remote video conferencing or other conferencing measures. Our next lunch with the league will be on May 6 at 1130. The topic is the status of women and you will be able to register for that luncheon just as you did this one via our Eventbrite page, our Facebook page, or our website. I'd like to direct you to our website. It's lwvsandiego.org. There you will find not only opportunities to participate in events, but also a recording of this event as well. We plan to curate this recording today and post it in the next day or so. So you will be able to go there and review it if you have any questions about what you hear today and you'll be able to share it with your friends who are unable to, to attend this morning. Um, I invite you to go to our calendar while you're there on our website. It's on the left menu bar. You can click it and go to our calendar and see what committee meetings and other events we're hosting and when, and you will find details on how to join if you click on them in our calendar. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for coming um, and I'd like to get started with the program. I'd like to just give a brief background and introduction about the topic today because it's a little bit um, complex and it's just a snippet of the criminal justice system in total. And we've assembled a really great um, group of panelists to delve into the details of the um, specifics of plea bargaining. But just as a little bit of background, um, many of us who are unfamiliar with the criminal justice system have the impression that most of the decisions in that system are made by juries in courtrooms following passionate arguments of prosecutors and defense attorneys. However, in reality, about 97% of criminal charges in California are resolved without ever getting to the courtroom, mainly by defendants and their attorneys accepting plea bargains offered by prosecutors. So a plea bargain is a negotiated agreement between a criminal defendant and a prosecutor in which the defendant agrees to plead guilty or no contest to some crimes along with possible conditions in return for the reduction of severity of the charges, dismissal of some of the charges, or some other benefit to the defendant. Plea bargains are often considered a way of establishing a mutual acknowledgement of a case's strengths and weaknesses and don't necessarily reflect a traditional sense of what we might consider justice. In theory, courts are happy to have the respective parties work out a solution by themselves, but it does beg the question of who is best served by these deals. Since so many criminal cases are settled by plea bargain, it suggests that they are popular with both prosecutors and defense attorneys. For prosecutors, it means saving time and resources. For defense attorneys, it means potentially saving their client from more serious charges and jail time. Finally, for defendants, it, means, it often means receiving a reduced sentence and resolving the matter quickly and with less expense. So today we're gonna look at plea bargaining in San Diego. So um, Juliana Humphrey works for the San Diego County Office of the Public Defender. She began practice as a trial attorney with Federal Defenders of San Diego, Inc. In 1989, she left federal practice to join the newly established San Diego County Office of the Public Defender and has been there ever since. She's been a trial attorney, appellate attorney, attorney supervisor, chief deputy, training attorney, and capital case trial attorney. She is currently a part of the Fresh Start program a unit that assists clients with relief from the negative effects of previous convictions. Ms. Humphrey consults with community groups on criminal justice issues, including SB 618 reentry program, drug court, and Prop 36, welfare fraud di diversion, domestic violence counsel, and sex offender management. She is past president of the California Public Defenders Association and is a frequent lecturer on criminal law and trial procedure and tactics. David Loy is legal director for the ACLU Foundation of San Diego and Imperial Counties, supervising its litigation and legal advocacy. David graduated from Northwestern University School of Law in 1994 and clerked for the Honorable Dolores K. Slaviter, the first woman appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. 
Since 1995, he has litigated civil and criminal trials and appeals in state and federal courts, serving as a staff attorney with Office of the Appellate Defender in New York City and Public Defender and Civil Rights Attorney in Spokane, Washington, before moving to San Diego in 2004 and joining the ACLU in 2006. Dwayne Woodley is San Diego County's Chief Deputy District Attorney. He has served as Deputy District Attorney for 19 years. Prior to that, he was a public defender for five years here in San Diego County. He began his legal career as a Judge Advocate General for the U.S. Navy, where he worked for five years. He has had various assignments, including Chief of Superior Court, Chief of Juvenile Division, and Chief of the South Bay Office before being elevated to Chief Deputy to replace current District Attorney Summer Steffen. He currently supervises all branch offices, including the Juvenile Division. He also oversees the Community Partnership Prosecutors. And back um, to Layla. Layla Aziz is the Director of Operations at Pillars of the Community, a nonprofit in San Diego that works to decriminalize community members through leadership development, civic engagement, and community building. Previously, she was with Metro United Methodist Urban Ministry for 19 years, serving in various capacities, including training organizations nationally and evidence-based best practices to decrease recidivism in youth and adult populations. In 2014, multiple youth enrollment in her program, multiple youth enrolled in her program were arrested and convicted for an obscure code. Layla left Metro and began working with Pillars where she could confront the recidivism machine. San Diego's criminal justice system head on without compromise. Layla grew up in southeastern San Diego, attending Valencia Park Elementary School, O'Farrell Charter, formerly known as the School of Performing Arts, Morris High School and Sarah High School. With a passion for violence intervention and prevention, Layla utilizes her workforce development, federal regulations, and youth offender expertise to advocate for policy changes on legislation that disproportionately impacts youth and communities of color. We're just gonna go to Ms. Juliana Humphrey and she has a presentation she'd like to present um, to us and then we'll, we'll just um, put Layla in when she can arrive. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Lori. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I too miss the lunch, but I'm very happy and uh, honored to be invited to discuss this important topic. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, uh, plea bargain does take on a heightened uh, meaning at this time. Uh, like everything else in our society, when um, times of stress occur, which is certainly now, uh, cracks in the system may show and may become uh, more intense. The pressures to enter into a plea bargain exist. And at this time, uh, the pressures to enter a plea bargain for reasons maybe that have nothing to do with the strength or weakness of a case uh, are again heightened. Um, I've been in public service for uh, 33 years next month. Um, and it's been my uh, pleasure to work at the Office of the Public Defender for 31 of it. Uh, my comments today, however, reflect my personal uh, reflections and remembrances and experiences, uh, and as everyone uh, in my office has their own uh, individual experiences, that's how I'd like to proceed now. Uh, I can say that nobody goes to law school to plead people guilty. Um, that's not really what we try to do and what our goal is. Uh, we all think of ourselves as trial warriors and are ready to fight for justice. And that means what all of you think it means in the courtroom, motions, trials, et cetera. Um, it was shocking to me in federal court then to, as a new lawyer, get in there and realize that 97% of my work was negotiation and pleas. Uh, that was federal court in the late 80s, and drugs were the name of the game. Uh, war on drugs and um, uh, increasing penalties. And I came into being when the guidelines, six months after I started the guidelines came in, and that changed plea bargaining irreparably. Uh, what was a six month plea deal today was five years the next day. Uh, it was to say the least quite disheartening uh, to deal with minimum mandatories and, and be looking at clients who uh, there was very little that litigation would help. Um, there was also introduced into guidelines the notion of downward departure in your guidelines if you were to uh, tell on someone else, a snitch is in the common parlance, 
uh, and that that was generally the only way you could get a lower sentence. Um, but unfortunately, those who were higher up the food chain had something to offer and those at the bottom did not. Uh, so all in all, it was not a um, experience uh, that led me to have a whole lot of faith uh, that justice was being done. Nonetheless, it proceeded, uh, but I jumped ship to the public defender's office in May of 1989, uh, hoping uh, for a better outcome. And boy, was it great only 95% pled instead of 97%. Uh, so that was fantastic. Um, but uh, there are many things in, 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 that are far superior in our state court system that I enjoy. But, but that was, uh, again, a rude awakening that most people plead. And not long after my start, we uh, started a, a litany of laws such as three strikes. Uh, increased enhancements for gun use and other things, uh, gang enhancements, which is a huge, had a huge impact on negotiation of plea deals. Um, what I call the enhancement of the week that was, uh, that was introduced in between 1990 and 2000, and the, penal, the code penal code pretty, pretty much pretty doubled much in doubled. size, I know, because I carried it to work. Uh, now it's electronic, so it's probably more insidious. It's probably quadrupled. Um, and it was, it became more and more as it was always there, but it became increasingly evident that uh, these new laws were having disproportionate effects on poor people, people of color. Um, and again, the drug war, the drug war rhetoric uh, and other uh, laws that were enacted at that time uh, were, you know, quite honestly, a reflection of institutional racism uh, that we are still dealing with today. So what is a plea bargain? Um, since I'm the person who is half of that story, uh, or a third, I should say, it is me, my client, and the district attorney, and then the judge either blesses it or does not. In the, uh, the basic premise of a plea bargain is, I make a plea, you give me a bargain. Uh, in a fair system, what are the best circumstances for that? Well, where the evidence is clear uh, and uh, compelling or provable, um, my clients very often uh, understand the evidence against them, most often actually, and feel remorse. Um, it can also, plea bargains also occur when both sides have a tough time of either defending or proving a case. And so then we get into issues of, is it worth the risk or not to go to trial? Um, an attorney uh, is, my job is to explain uh, what the evidence is and the the lay of the land as it were to my client and talk to them about realistic options. The district attorney offers a reasonable resolution that fits both the client and the crime. Uh, and clients quite often in my experience um, want to settle. They understand that prolonging the issue causes them, them distress and worry for their families, for their friends, for uh, you know the victim they have, um, uh, they, would like to get credit for an early admission of wrongdoing, uh, which is often the case in, in our settlement departments. Uh, and a lot of my clients want to say they're sorry, and they can't do that until the case is over with. Um, but of course, the main reason is they do not want to be punished excessively. Um, you know, they can't blame someone, and then that's the number one question I get is, what am I facing? Because logically, our freedom, our liberty, is uh, the most important, precious thing to us. So from the defense point of view, which is uh, my role here, um, those arrested are entitled to know the minimum they are facing, the maximum they are facing, uh, the uh, extra uh, implications of their sentencing. Do they have to register as sex offenders for the rest of their lives? Do they have to register as narcotic offenders? Does this, uh, this plea give them a strike? on their record that will impact them in the future? Do they have to do probation? Do they have to do any other kinds of um, uh, classes or therapeutic interventions? All those are things that we have to discuss. Uh, and my client is entitled to my uh, experience with the law. Do I think this is a good case or a bad case? Do I think this is you know, something that is winnable or not winnable? I'll tell you right now, I never give anyone over 50-50 odds because anything can happen. 
any juror can walk in. On the other hand, I am quite candid to say, yes, I, you know, certainly if you're asking me, I, this is a case worthy of going to trial or on the flip side, it is not. And I give reasons why. Um, but attorneys, I think our job also is to explore whether our client understands what we are talking to them about. There are many issues that play into that, education levels, uh, language differences, uh, uh, the mental illness, uh, addiction, um, trauma that has previously been suffered by clients, which is generally about 80% of them. I'm, I do a felony practice. Uh, and so all those things have to be factored in by me to make sure that my client, you know, if he decides or she decides to make a plea, that it is knowing and voluntary. And things cannot be knowing and voluntary, you know, if they're not. And so I am the, the person who looks into that and makes sure that that is true. Um, I am just entitled to reasonable discovery to make those things. Discovery is uh, police reports and whatnot. We hear a lot about body-worn cameras. A lot of times that is also reviewed with my client uh, in an effort to uh, decide whether to settle the case or not. And I also go over a plea form. I have a little show and tell. This is a plea form. It's three pages long. This is what has gone over with in open court uh, with uh, the judge, the prosecutor, myself, and my client. And the judge asks all the questions on that form. And as a lawyer, I have to, uh, to aver that I have indeed explained every single item on there. On there are things not just, the, as I said, the consequences of the case, itself, but also immigration consequences, collateral consequences like that. And as you might imagine, there are many. Um, so uh, in plea bargaining, I bet Dwayne will probably address this a little more. There's plea bargaining and charge bargaining. A plea bargain, uh, excuse me, a charge bargain or a sentence bargain. Charges are you plead to one charge, the rest are dismissed. Uh, as an example, or a sentence bargaining, I will get no more than 180 days for whatever it is I'm pleading guilty to, or I will not get time, I will get some alternative to custody. Those are sentence bargains that have to be agreed to by the court. Um, but make no mistake, most of the power in a plea bargaining situation is with the DA. The judge has to act if he accepts, he or she accepts it in the parameters of the plea bargain, or it is uh, you know, has to, we have to start all over. Um, and uh, where, where did that start? Uh, uh, that was way back in the 1970s. There was a movement away from judges making decisions. In California, we went to determinate sentencing as, a, as opposed to indeterminate sentencing. And more and more power was vested in prosecutors, local prosecutors, rather than judges. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that just kind of snowballed and enabled a tough on crime enactment of more and more laws uh, and created the situation of mass incarceration that we're dealing with today. So what, how am I doing on time? I didn't even look. Uh, I, the reality is though that the, um, the playing field is neither smooth nor level in situations of plea bargains. Uh, um, we are often rushed. There is a, a need, a seeming need for judicial economy and everyone to make a decision immediately. Uh, it's nice to have readiness conferences, which our, our jurisdiction has, um, but I am dealing with someone who is usually scared, vulnerable, maybe coming off of drugs or alcohol, maybe mentally ill, and they may be asked to make a decision about whether they should get 10 years or 20 years and do it in half an hour. And that's just a really hard thing to ask someone to do. Uh, you would not buy a car that way. And so signing up for uh, a big chunk of your life behind bars uh, should uh, at least have uh, as much time as that. The other wild card is attorneys. Some attorneys are prepared. Some have more information than others. Some have more experience than others. Uh, some have been unable to get the information uh, they need. Some are risk averse and, and bring that to their client. Some are maybe the opposite of risk averse and, and bring that to their client. Um, and so that is another wild card. Sometimes district attorneys um, are not willing to give enough discovery really at the beginning to make a decision. There's a little gamesmanship sometimes with some people 
Uh, it's particularly problematic in, in alleged gang cases where everything is viewed to be top secret. Um, and again, mentally ill, addicted, or traumatized clients um, may be unable to see the wisdom of taking a deal or may want to take one when it's not in their best interest. Uh, we need to do more investigation into their backgrounds and, and see uh, what else is available for them. And that takes time. And sometimes time is not what we are given. Uh, and there is um, an incentive that I think our community is finally realizing to plead when you are not guilty. If you are facing multiple counts with multiple allegations and you are facing, you know, the proverbial life in custody, five or 10 years does not seem bad. And, it, and if you are afraid that you will never see your family again, that is something you will do. And, and I think in the past, there's been a thought, a glib thought, a privileged thought to say, well, I'd never plead to anything, especially you know, something involving violence or sex. And I think we need to look no further than our own backyard uh, to the Brian Banks story. This was a case that our own California Innocence Project worked on. <clears throat> this is a young man in high school in Long Beach who pleaded guilty to a rape case that he did not do because he was otherwise going to be facing 40 plus years in custody. Uh, he took a deal, he thought he was gonna get probation. He ended up going to prison for five years and took another five to clear his name. And it was determined that the person who made that claim, another high schooler, was lying. And, had, and she and her mom ended up having financial incentive to keep that lie as long as they did. And so that is a young man who was on his way to USC to play football, who took a deal, who hired a lawyer. His family hired a lawyer. They went over the evidence and said, yeah, uh, I, I guess that's what I should do. And so it happens. We, we don't need to, um, I, I hope that the lesson from that, and by the way, it's a very entertaining and uplifting movie, despite the way I'm describing it. Uh, it, it is real that there is pressure on people to take deals uh, for something that they did not do. And, the, and my circling back to COVID and our current situation is my concern is that if someone is not lucky enough to be charged with something where zero bail is being imposed um, or able to post bail, in reality, they may be risking their lives if they don't take something that gets them out sooner. And that's a real consideration. There's nothing we can do about that. And so, uh, you know, I am not, um, in any way advocating to abolish plea bargains, quite the opposite. It would be nice to reform them. It would be nice to make the playing field uh, more even. Um, and uh, it would be nice to have less probation on more cases. It would be nice to not prosecute as many cases as we could. Um, I will touch on one thing is that oftentimes a plea bargain involves pleading guilty to a misdemeanor when you're charged with a felony. And, and un, probably not a funny joke to you, but one that is make, makes the rounds in the courthouse is, oh, innocent people get a misdemeanor. That, that somehow that that's okay, that someone pleads to a misdemeanor when they do not, they, you know, don't want to, or they aren't guilty of anything. Um, and misdemeanors have huge consequences and can derail someone's life and their education and their job opportunities, you know, not as much as a felony, but in many significant ways. And so that is not uh, a good result when someone uh, is innocent. Um, and of course, they come with probation too, which has its own uh, tail of horrors, like a Fourth Amendment waiver and other things to do. So. Uh, Probation is a whole another conversation. Um, but I will just say, um, I think that uh, our courts have moved in the right direction in 2012. The Supreme Court uh, uh, put into law uh, what we all know is true, and that is that people like me, defenders, have the obligation to give good and accurate and true information to clients in a manner that makes them able to accept or reject a plea bargain at the time it's made and not to uh, make mistakes of fact or law in that process. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation today. That was very informative and you obviously have a lot of information about the system, how it works and years of experience in it. 
um, that you can provide for our attendees today. So um, some of the topics you touched on, we're gonna circle back around in a Q&A. I had prepared some questions, so you'll get a chance to expand on some of those um, points that you made there um, as well. But since um, you know we are in a technologically um, required situation here, and we all are, are all doing our best to get on and um, log in and participate. I wanted to just um, reintroduce our local activist, Layla Aziz. She had a little bit of trouble getting on earlier today, and she's made it um, to our presentation now and our webinar, and she's um, ready to share her point of view, her perspective as a political activist in San Diego. And um, this is a good reminder for us to just all be patient with each other and to just um, take it one minute at a time and work together and help support each other. So Layla, it's um, your opportunity now for your presentation. So thank you and I appreciate you showing up. Thank you so much. I have been on the streets with thousands of people wondering about our safety and the anxiety of not being able to reboot a Cox modem surpassed that. <laughs> it seemed to take forever. Um, thank you for having me. I wanted to really touch on how Pillars of the Community came into really understanding or even challenging the court system, particularly plea bargains. We began our work because of 33 young African American men who were arrested in 2014, I believe. And at that time, I was a director of operations for a national program. There were about six of the young men who were arrested were in my program. I knew them very well. I knew them to, I knew their strengths. I knew their protective factors. I also knew their risk. When this happened, we were told, well, I got a call from a young man in county jail. And he said, Miss Layla, um, they're trying to give me life for Facebook pictures. And I said, that's not how the court system works, honey. I wasn't really intimately involved in the court system, but I knew it didn't work like that, even from just basic television and basic um, interacting in the community. So I called his attorney who told me that he had 75,000 pages of discovery. He would not, he has no idea what's going on at that moment. And I watched that case um, as it went through the court systems um, from probable cause to what is probable cause, what is reasonable doubt, and how those things interact um, with people plea bargaining or even losing at trial. I saw that the way that I understood the court system, that you're either guilty, you have a guilty mind, you have a guilty heart, and you did a guilty act, that's how it works, that's our criminal justice system. I realized that it wasn't, because these young men who were on trial, facing 25 to life, whose bail was $1.5 million, so they could not bail out, they were charged with an obscure penal code from a 78 page ballot proposition, Prop 21, that said that they could be convicted for being documented in a gang if those other gang members committed a crime. And those of us who live in my community and understood gang documentation at its heart knew that the way that you documented a person in the gang was many times based on where they lived. They had carved out certain areas, and if you were stopped in those areas, you could three times, you could be documented in the gang. If you were stopped in that area with, your, with a friend who was documented and you had on colors from your school, you could be documented that one time because you had three hits. So it was very unfair to us on how this was done. And then the implications after you were documented, the fact that you had no administrative relief, you couldn't challenge your documentation, but yet when you went into the criminal justice system, you were overcharged. And when I say it's, it's sometimes it's not just overcharging and the speaker before me spoke on this. I've seen young men who were convicted of firing a gun, who never had a gun, never knew a gun was there and lost their life because of how gang laws are written. It's something called vicarious liability where you can get the personal discharge of a firearm, even if you did not shoot a firearm and did not know a firearm was going to be shot by anyone. And so this caused a lot of devastation. But now with penal code 182.5, where no crime even had to be committed. Um, you, you were in a different state. One young man was in juvenile hall and every crime was committed, still facing that amount of time. And the law stating that that is okay. Looking at um, later, and I'll go into later how we, 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 we really kind of delved into this and broke it apart and saw a lot of the, the unfairness in our criminal justice system. While they were in there, some young people pled. We had a young man, and I think of DeAndre all the time because he was in juvenile hall when the, when the actual acts were taken. And 
he got out and he, he changed his life. He worked for the, the water department in San Diego and he had a child. His um, mother of his child was a stay at home mom and he was doing the right thing. He was on his way to purchasing a home. He was, he was happy, and, but he didn't let his friends go. So he would let his friends come over and they would have fun. They didn't do any criminal acts. He would go to the beach with his friends. So we'd have pictures at the beach with his friends on Facebook, but he didn't do any criminal acts. He worked for the water department and he was a father and a, a, a husband and a son. And the district attorney, when they decided that they, because the district, the police didn't come to the district attorney and say, hey, we'd like to prosecute these guys. The district attorney went to the police and said, hey, let's try to use this new penal code. And when these young men were arrested, his father died of leukemia. And the, his, his child's mom lost the, ch the child to the system because she couldn't hold on. And he was told, take the plea bargain, you'll be home in a year. If not, you're not coming home. What's gonna happen to your son? And he took the plea bargain. And he ended up going to prison for about a year. And some of the guys who did it were Aaron and um, Brandon. And there were times when Brandon wanted to take the plea bargain. And Aaron would tell him, don't take it, please don't take it, they can't do this. But they started to lose faith in the justice system because they were incarcerated. And every single day that went by, um, they saw their lives taken away forever. The fact that their bail, and, and even statistics tell you that if a person stays in jail, they're more likely to plead guilty. And if a person pleads guilty from jail, they're more likely to do jail or prison time. And so we're looking at those repercussions and those statistics and the community came behind these young men. And when they saw the community come behind them, they, began, they got grave. Um, but it wasn't always good stories. Brandon and Aaron ended up having their charges dropped. But another young man, his attorney, the one who called me, his attorney who had 75,000 pages of discovery ended up having a health crisis in the courtroom where he was taken to the hospital in the middle of the proceedings. And this young man wants to come home. They cannot believe that they are on trial for Facebook pictures. And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna this is a young man with an IEP, which is special education. He's, and they're all, all of the defendants are together. And he said, I'm going to represent myself. You're not gonna then make me wait in jail for another year and do this all over. And so he did and he ended up getting convicted and he has 25 to life. He's sitting in a prison now. Um, there's a lot, we, we believe he may come home on appeal. But in that, the, the, the depression, the desperation, and just having his life completely taken from him for only benefiting, <laughs> however that means, from a gang, that, from a community that you, were, you grew up in. And we look at other people, um, Stephen, he was one of my kids, and Stephen ended up pleading while he was in county jail. And he was picked up on 182.5. He wasn't around. Um, I think he was another young man. He was in juvenile hall the whole time. So they, he had an alibi of not being around during any crime. And I remember when we taught him, we, we taught him know your rights before this happened. And he went through a know your rights training. And he decided he was going to go to Euclid Trolley Station and tell people their rights with his, his know your rights flyers. And he went to jail. And I remember having to go through that situation with the police. Because when you arrest a person in the different charges, they're all based on probable cause. And that's another thing with plea bargaining. Um, normally it's done before preliminary, not trial. And some states, they don't have to give the discovery until trial. San Diego, mostly before pre, I mean, California, before pretrial. But uh, most of the time you don't get it leading up to that, but you get very, it's piecemeal. And then all of a sudden um, we'll be court supporting with participatory defense and the defense attorney will say, the DA just laid 1,200 pages of discovery on me. So that shows you that during plea bargaining, when they, that's when they decide to go to trial. Before plea bargaining, um, defendants kind of plead without knowledge of even what's against them. So it's a probable cause determination without any safeguards of the criminal justice system that destroys lives. Um, prison sentences, the ramifications afterwards, the collateral issues that happen from employment to housing to even education, all of these things. And what's happened was, because we're a plea bargaining town, we're a plea bargaining country. Even if you look up our, um, performance goals for the district attorney um, in the county of San Diego's budget, it states that 65% of their folks will plea bargain before they get to prelim, not trial, prelim. And that's one of their goals. And they also have a conviction rate goal. I believe that's about 70%. And they do well, they surpass their goals. And which means that a majority of people plea bargain based on probable cause, not reasonable doubt. And that's scary. 
when we began participatory defense, it was began with one of the guys from 182.5, Alonzo Harvey. And it was based on bringing community members into the courtroom and organizing with community members to ensure that these things stop happening. And so what we do is we meet weekly. And family members who have a loved one who's facing um, a sentence or even a person who's bailed out, which normally is not the case, who's facing a sentence, they come and they mobilize and they organize around their loved one's case. And they're the lead organizer around their loved one's case. It takes the mystery and the, and the fear out of the court system when you see people that are most impacted come together and learn the procedure, learn the process, and even learn the unfair laws. And this has led to some really significant things. You have family members who were victims of a criminal justice system who now talk to legislatures and lobby. We have a young, another young man where we're looking at just overcharging in the district attorney's office. He was being beaten by one of the district attorney's informants. And he was being, a woman was beat with a crowbar earlier that day. Um, this young man has a rape case, but he's paid. He's on their payroll. He's, he's not mandated to have any kind of uh, mental health treatment. So he's just allowed in our community, my community where my sons are, and he's allowed to do whatever he wants to do. And this young man who'd never been in trouble a day in his life was playing video games. He goes to the store. But he happens to know the guys that this man had had an altercation with hours before. So the DA informant starts beating him. And he's a little guy. And he's like 18. The informant is this big, muscular guy, right? And he's told his brothers these lies. So they're helping him beat these younger kids. And the kid runs. And the guy chases him into the street, onto the, um, almost into the street. And the kid tries to get away from him. And the guy, big guy, takes his jacket. And he's just brutalizing this kid. And shots rang out. And... We all look at life because the informant's brother ended up dying. We look at life and the meaning of life. But this young man was not allowed to even have self-defense. We look at how our country works. First degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, what your heart was, where, where your mind was, what is your culpability? The district attorney charged him with first degree murder to ensure he can't make bail, to ensure that they are positioned for the best plea bargain period. And, and, and those are things that directly in our community speak to the unfairness because we have another young man, DeBron, who was shot after an altercation at a taco shop. And there was, he had no weapon and he was murdered. And the person who shot him fled the scene, threw the gun, and he was not arrested. And they decided not to charge him, even though the gun wasn't registered, all of those great things um, with anything, not even voluntary manslaughter. And his family seeing these, and these two families coming together and seeing these as demonstrated where the pain is and, and why people plea bargain and, and the time that they get. And I just want to say that these families are the reason why legislatures are now coming to court watch. So they'll be court watching Mason's court hearing because they want to know why he has, is even charged with first degree murder. Um, a life does matter. But all lives do matter. And he still has the same benefits of the criminal justice system as anyone else. No one's asking for a get out of free charge, get out of free, <laughs> get out of jail free uh, ticket. But we are demanding that we're treated just as human as every other person in the criminal justice system. So I just want to thank you for just hearing some of the stories from those that we love. Aaron Harvey, who did beat 182.5, is in Berkeley. He's going on his third year, I believe. Um, Alonzo Harvey, who started participatory defense, was a victim of 182.5. He pled. He just got um, accepted to. Berkeley and UC Davis. And we're saying that there's another way. We don't need to be a recidivism machine with 65% recidivism statewide and 23% recidivism countywide for probation. We can do much better. Let's use multidisciplinary teams before plea bargaining. Let's get the specialists to understand what's going on at the table. Let's use science. Let's take probable cause out of that and stop allowing people to plea bargain. And a lot of these people, I can tell you, are innocent. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. I really appreciate your time here today and the stories that you're sharing with us are so relevant and they're real life stories of people on the street. And I know that you do a lot of work um, for and with um, the uh, people who are impacted by these laws and plea bargaining in particular. So I really appreciate your perspective. Um, and, and you too raised some points here in your presentation that we are going to circle back around with in questions that we've prepared and perhaps other questions that our attendees will provide after the presentations um, wrap up. So with that, we're gonna move now to um, ACLU Legal Director David Loy for his um, presentation. 
Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Leila and Juliana. And I'm just looking forward to Duane's presentation as well. Thank you, Lori, for moderating and, and the league for organizing this. Um, as with Juliana, I will offer a disclaimer that uh, though I do work for the Institute Foundation in San Diego and Imperial County, I am um, speaking in this presentation for myself, my own personal views, uh, based on my experiences, uh, much more limited in the criminal system than, than, than those of my colleagues here, but I was a public defender both on trial and appeal for about five years, uh, and I have maintained some speaking acquaintance you know, with, the, with the system. Um, I, I want to step back for a minute and sort of draw out some themes that I think were very well expressed uh, by my colleagues, uh, but also just name them um, from a more systemic from a, from a systemic perspective. Just that you know, as with the uh, entire criminal punishment system, um, the current plea bargaining regime is built on a series of choices that are baked into our laws, which are made against a backdrop of significant racial and economic inequality in society. Now, one may agree or disagree with those choices, uh, but I think it's important to name them and identify them as choices because what has been chosen can be changed. Uh, and I think as, as Layla mentioned, you know, there, there are uh, movements and activism and advocacy to change some of these choices. But none of this is written in stone. So I would like to uh, name a few of what I see are the systemic choices baked into the system that inform um, everything that my colleagues have, have, have spoken to, and I'm sure we'll speak to after. Uh, one is the, the threshold choice of what to classify as a crime. You know, there is no charge to bargain if there's no crime to charge. And legislatures make decisions about what conduct to criminalize. And what they choose to criminalize, they can choose to decriminalize. It is not a given that everything in the penal code must necessarily be a crime, including, for example, uh, drug charges. Uh, in 2001, for example, Portugal decriminalized the personal possession and consumption of uh, numerous substances in favor of a civil, administrative, and therapeutic approach. That is a choice. You know, other countries make different choices. We are free to make those choices here. Um, there's another choice yeah. about what penalties yeah. to impose. There is another choice they made about what penalties to impose. Um, legislatures decide what the punishment for a crime should be. You know, as, as was mentioned, uh, enacting sometimes very severe mandatory minimums or enhancements for certain charges. The higher the sentence, the higher the exposure to the, to the person charged, the more leverage that gives the prosecutors. That derives from a policy choice. Um, the prosecutor's offices, the district attorneys have discretion. What crimes do they charge? What enhancements do they charge? They don't have to charge a crime at all, as was mentioned. They don't have to charge every potential available crime. Um, cases can be diverted with non-criminal solutions um, in, in many circumstances. You know, those options either, some may exist in the law, some can be created in the law, some can be done through the exercise of discretion. Um, as has been mentioned, often the underlying, the conduct underlying criminal charges is driven by illness, trauma, and addiction. Uh, there can be non-criminal solutions to that. And that gets me to what I see as the fourth choice here is what resources has, has the society and the government uh, made available for individuals who can't afford treatment and services? Um, you know, what kinds of education services and treatment are available to those uh, most impacted by trauma and um, when they're unable to uh, afford to pay for them privately or lack insurance? You know, it is entirely possible that the more services, the more treatment, the more support there is for people uh, who have experienced illness, trauma, or addiction, uh, perhaps the less crimes there will be to charge. Um, uh, fifth choice, uh, whether to incarcerate someone before trial, as I think Layla mentioned and Juliana alluded to, uh, uh, those who are incarcerated before trial uh, have an extraordinarily compelling incentive to, to reach a plea bargain. Um, a big part of that is uh, detention decisions that are made by judges. A big part of that is the, the position of the district attorney in seeking to detain before trial. And a big part of that is the whole system of money bail. 
and when and when and whether and to what extent the inability to pay uh, for a release uh, is equitable. Uh, California is moving away from that to some degree. There may it may be replaced by things like uh, risk al algorithms. You know, I will let others speak to the details of that because I'm not immersed in that. But it's important to be aware that the uh, risk metrics and algorithms themselves may bake in uh, racial and economic inequality. Uh, and it's important to, to recognize these are all choices that are made at every point in the system. Uh, finally, uh, my sixth choice is, and this gets to some points made by both Leila and Juliana, how much to fund public defense? How consistent is the funding? How consistent is the availability? How consistent is the quality of public defense? Um, not all, you know, not all lawyers are trained and supported equally. Even the best lawyer and the best defense counsel uh, cannot possibly take every case to trial when they're carrying uh, caseloads in the hundreds. And that is a choice. It is a choice that government makes how much to fund public defense compared to the level of funding for police and prosecution. Um, and finally, um, and last, my last choice I'll identify is how much do we fund the courts? How many judges, courtrooms, court personnel are available? How many jurors are available? How many courtrooms are available? You know, there is enormous pressure to plea bargain when there is not enough sufficient space in the courtrooms to adjudicate cases at trial. And I'm not, and I am not in any way suggesting that every case must go to trial. As Juliana said, there, there can be good and important reasons uh, to negotiate a resolution. And that's true in both civil and criminal litigation. Uh, but I, I, I would like to suggest that perhaps choices should be made that would make every one of those negotiations a much more equitable and level playing field. Because right now, I think the reality is, as a result of all of these policy choices that have been made over decades, um, the playing field is significantly tilted in favor of the government and against the persons facing criminal charges. All right, thank you so much for that perspective. I appreciate that you kind of gave us a thousand foot view. Um, you talked about the system from start to finish and how people enter it and kind of where plea bargaining falls on that continuum. So I appreciate that perspective. Um, and as with you and the other um, speakers so far, we actually have curated some questions um, that will allude to and address some of the points that you made there as well. So um, thank you for your perspective. Um, our last panelist and the one that um, is gonna be a great balance um, on our discussion today is Chief Deputy District Attorney Dwayne Woodley. And um, I'm very looking forward to hearing from you and um, having your perspective on this as well. So thank you so much for agreeing to participate with us today and share your experience. Thank you very much for being here. Good, good afternoon to everyone. And um, I'm very happy to be here and honored to represent uh, the San Diego County District Attorney's Office for this important discussion regarding our criminal justice system. Um, I, I bring a unique uh, perspective to this discussion because I have worked not only as a public defender, um, not only as a defense attorney in the United States Navy when I was on active duty as a JAG officer, but also at the public defender's office here in San Diego County for five years, actually working for Ms. Humphrey uh, when I was at that office, and now as a prosecutor for the last uh, 19, 20 years. Uh, when we talk about, uh, I, I wanna talk about plea bargaining just generally, and then talk a little bit about what we're doing during the course of this crisis as it relates to plea bargaining from the San Diego County District Attorney's perspective. Uh, when we talk about plea bargaining, obviously um, with the judicial economy and the amount of cases that we have rolling through the criminal justice system, um, it's important that, uh, that we resolve some of these cases. And there's really no way to try 100% of the cases that come within the system. So the process allows us to reduce the cases to the, to the number that um, would allow us to try enough that the system will allow, ha able to handle. And so right now here in, in our county, we, we resolve between 90, 93% of the cases um, pre-trial. And the benefits to that is not only that it reduces the uh, workload on the courts, um, but it also gives defendants a predictability of what the results will be. Ultimately, what, what charges are gonna be found guilty of, if possible, what charges will be dismissed, and, and also what sentence they may receive as a result of that. Um, we each have different roles in the system. The defense attorneys have the right, role of protecting their clients' constitutional rights, uh, ensuring that um, their rights are protected throughout all stages of the process. 
Um, and the judge has to the role to oversee that process. And our role as prosecutors are to uh, make sure that we are uh, participating in a fair process, um, that there's fairness to the defendant in that process, um, looking out for the safety of our victims, as well as uh, making sure that we maintain and protect public safety. And we, we take that role very seriously, and that kind of guides everything that we do and the decisions that we make. There's two, type of, two types of plea bargaining, and I think Ms. Humphreys mentioned it earlier. There's charge plea bargaining, and then there's sentence plea bargaining. Charge plea bargaining is when you decide on a particular charge that you are asking for from a, a potential defendant uh, to plead to. And then the sentencing of that defendant will be left up to the court to decide. And then there are sentencing plea bargains. And that is where we are not only negotiating the charge, but also what particular sentence that we think is appropriate fair for this particular case. And um, in the misdemeanor land, most of those cases are resolved through charge bargaining. And in felony land, both charge and sentencing plea bargaining are uh, utilized. In our court system, we, uh, plea bargaining process takes place from usually starts at the pre-prelim stage is the readiness conference that's occurred prior to the prelim. Once a defendant's arraigned and then he's allowed to have a, a, a readiness conference and that's the beginning of the plea bargaining process. You normally in our system at the readiness stage. That process can take place throughout the whole litigation all the way up to right before jury uh, returns a verdict in the case. But after the pre-prelim pre -prelim stage, then we have a pre-trial readiness conference where we once again sit down with the defense attorney, the judge, and, and talk about the facts and, and the evidence in the case and, and try to come to a fair resolution. Um, and so that process takes place as we go through the litigation and the parties are discussing the strengths and weaknesses of the cases and ultimately whether or not that case should go to trial or not. The process, I, we try to balance fairness throughout that process, as well as uh, ensuring that um, we get a, a result that results in maintaining public safety. What we have been doing uh, since this pandemic has taken place, which has completely uprooted our criminal justice system. You know, our court has been suspended and closed since this process, and we've had, um, from the very beginning, we have uh, sought out a process with our justice partners, that's the public defender, the court, the sheriff's department, to work on concrete solutions to get people out of custody, to um, provide a situation in which uh, we can continue to maintain public health within our, um, within our institution um, jail facilities. Um, we did this from the very beginning. As soon as, this, as, soon as the court was closed, um, we began a process of um, targeting our uh, in-custody defendants in three different ways. One, we first looked at all the pre-arraignment defendants, defendants who had not appeared before the court that had an opportunity to be arraigned. Um, we looked at our vulnerable population, where there are older and elderly folks in our penal institutions that um, we needed to get out of that facility in order to maintain their health. Some of the low-level um, defendants that were in custody, um, we begin a process in which we uh, were allowed to uh, send orders to the judge, a judge would sign an order, and then those defendants would be released from custody. Um, and then we moved on to our pre-prelim uh, pre defendants, and then also to our pre-trial defendants. And this, this process that we engaged in um, allowed us to reduce our jail population by over 20% um, at that time. Um, and that process has also um, led to a uh, reduction in our jail population. Um, currently now, at the beginning of this process, it was about 5,500 defendants. Now we're at like 4,200. 4, and we did all that prior to the uh, Judicial Council releasing the emergency bail order, which um, mandated that all misdemeanors have zero bail and all low-level felonies would be a zero bail um, result. Um, we also, at that point, looked at that population and determined that um, any of those persons that were subject to the zero bail, if there were several defendants who we were concerned about for public safety purposes, we'd ask the court to consider allowing us an opportunity to present our arguments to the court of why this person may be a public safety risk. But also it allowed us not to object to all those releases, but also to allow us the opportunity to have the court order additional conditions whether that's uh, protective orders, 
um, stay away orders. Once again, from the perspective of trying to protect the public. Um, when we talk when we talk about plea bargaining, I, I would agree with you that the history of our criminal justice system has not always been fair, especially to um, our certain part segments of our society. I think. One of the things that I would like to make a distinction, and I think it's really important, as you travel the country and you talk to other jurisdictions, the way things are done nationally are a lot different than the way we do them here in San Diego County. Um, we have specialty courts. We have um, courts that allow from our veterans court, from our mental health, our behavioral health courts. Um, we have courts, specialty courts assigned to keep people out of the system. Uh, I know Summer Stephan, our DA, um, when she came in to office and took um, sworn as the DA, one of the things that she wanted to do is, is try to come up with solutions and ideas to keep people out of the criminal justice system. And that's why she instituted our criminal justice initiative, which is um, a process that if you are charged with a misdemeanor offense, your first time touching the court, you are allowed to um, divert that offense, um, attend a cognitive behavioral therapy class, and if you complete that class and stay out of trouble, for six months, your case will be dismissed. We've been we've been uh, running that program here in San Diego County in all four branches, and um, we've had a, a 90%, 98% lack of recidivism rate on those cases. So that means 98% of the people that have completed the program have not reoffended. And this is an opportunity to keep people out of the system. I think we all, as a, as participants in the criminal justice system, need to come up with ideas to increase that those opportunities for people to stay out of the system. We are actively working on those issues every single day. Uh, one of the things that uh, Summer uh, allowed, the legislature passed uh, Penal Code Section 1170D, which allowed district attorneys to petition the court to reduce um, inmate sentences that are currently serving them in, criminal, in, the, in our state prison system. Summer was the first person to allow, recall a defendant sentence who was looking at 65 years to life and had done 16, 17 years of that sentence. She was the first DA in the state of California to uh, have that sentence recalled and have him given, given credit for time served because he had performed admirably, admirably while in custody. So these are some of the things that we're doing to um, keep our system fair. Um, we have, and by no means have we um, achieved that process yet. There's still things that we can do better. And the thing that everybody hit, that I think everybody understands is that the, the motivation is to be fair, but also maintain public safety by the process that we utilize. Thank you. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate your perspective. And I'm sure that everyone on this um, webinar appreciates the um, opportunity that you've had to serve on both sides of this issue and to um, be intimately knowledgeable about it and um, and also work to create more a more just system in, in your current capacity. So um, I truly appreciate your participation and your um, experience with this topic. Okay. So um, the first question is to all of our panelists and it's um, it's kind of an existential question regarding the Constitution and how plea bargaining fits in with that. Um, and so we'll just take it as the panelists want to address it. So it, it, this is the question. A, a guilty plea waives the constitutional right to trial and subordinates trial rights, such as the right to confront one's accusers. Waivers of constitutional rights often are held invalid when they have been required as a condition for receiving favorable governmental treatment. Furthermore, plea bargains are predicated on a presumption of guilt, not innocence. How do you square plea bargaining with the Constitution and defendants' rights? Uh, there are, um, there is the ability to waive rights, um, and the reason that the taking of a plea is constitutional, uh, and through it's not just the Constitution, but of course case law that has interpreted the um, the use of plea bargaining. Uh, has, is is very long and, and very ancient, uh, and it and it does talk about you cannot um, one of the well you cannot do it without being it without it being voluntary and knowing those are the keys, and so on the very first page of a plea form, 
um, you, a client and a lawyer together fill out, a, fill out this part that says, I have not been induced to enter this plea by any promise or representation of any kind except, and that is the plea bargain that's written there. And then it says, I am entering my plea freely and voluntarily without fear or threat to me or anyone closely related to me. Hopefully that's obvious. Uh, and I am sober. My judgment is not impaired. I have not consumed any drug, alcohol, or narcotics so, so that I don't understand what's going on. And so people can make a bargain. Um, and it's the idea is that you would, in a perfect world, that you would make that bargain to your benefit. Rights are no good to have in the ether. They have to do you some good. And so if it is, uh, if you are at the point in a case or uh, in a, a situation where you find yourself and your liberty at stake and you would rather make a plea bargain, then the rights that you have should enable you to do or to pursue the outcome that you would like to pursue. Um, the, other, the other one important thing also is you have the right to be represented by a lawyer at all stages. You have to aver that that is true. You can waive that right if you want to as well. That's a Sixth Amendment right, but you have that right. Uh, and then the judge also individually goes over the rights that the person is giving up, such as speedy and public trial, confronting and cross-examining -exam witnesses, remaining silent or testifying, uh, and being able to present evidence on one's behalf. That is subpoenaing things, having your lawyer be able to call witnesses as well. All those things are gone over in such detail is because we do recognize that those are super precious rights that we all have. Uh, and so that, that the, that's why it's done in open court. That's why it's done in writing and verbally, because again, in the perfect situation, you want to make sure that it is done to the benefit of both parties. Um, you know, is there someone who is fearful and enters a plea? Of course. Uh, this is a very stressful situation. Most of the time when I talk to my clients afterwards, they don't even remember what happened in court because it's just so stressful. Um, that's why I'm sta sta standing right next to them to answer any questions and to make sure that this is done appropriately. But that is, that's the, the I think answers the question as to why or whether that's been blessed by our Supreme Court and our, juris and our jurisprudence and it has. Great, thank you so much. Do any of the other panelists want to um, chime in on that particular question? Okay, Ms. Aziz? Hi, yes. Recently, we because we have participatory defense, we're in the courtroom every single day. So we see a lot of um, the hemorrhaging that's going on and some of the good work that's going on also. We had a young man and his mom called me and said, the, the district attorney has offered my son a deal, but he must waive his rights to any further legislation that comes about. And because we've been doing that so long, we're like, but that goes against the, uh, what a plea bargain is. You have, to, you have to, it has to be knowing. You have to understand what the repercussions are. And so we began to ask around. It was called a Harris waiver. And it was kind of interesting because it was done because of the legislation that our organization had passed, which is the um, Nickel Pryor and the one-year enhancement. And people who had pled were able to go and then try to get, uh, because some of those enhancements were mandated and now they're discretionary or eliminated. But um, it ended up making legislation where the Harris waiver, which said that they pretty much waived their, um, any legislation that came that could, they could benefit from, from a judge or legislation, ended up um, becoming one of the biggest bipartisan bills that um, Republicans and Democrats supported stating that you cannot do that. So those are just some of the things, but if that had been allowed, that would have been another part of our plea bargaining system where you could give up your rights without knowing them. Right, thank you. Anyone, any other panelists want to take that question or uh, maybe el elaborate on some of the comments? Okay, well, um, since we have kind of alluded, oh, Mr. Woodley, would you like yeah, to Yeah, I just want, okay. I just wanted to chime in a thank little you. bit and say, one of the things that, um, you, that and I, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, but just as far as the process, what we, uh, when you look around the country and like in New York and other jurisdictions, Mississippi, Louisiana, and about the process, the plea bargain process that they uh, undergo in those jurisdictions, I'll, I'll, until recently in New York, the defense wasn't even given the discovery until 30 days before trial. So they were being, offers were being made before they even had 
um, the police reports to indicate what the evidence was against them. Um, and that's a lot different than what we do in the state of California. I mean, we provide discovery, uh, what the allegations are, what the evidence are, is uh, prior to the prelim. So as part of our plea bargain process, it's a lot more fair here in the state of California than it may be in other jurisdictions. So a lot of times when you hear this on a national stage about the unfairness of the system, it's important to make a distinction between what goes on nationally and what goes on here in our jurisdiction in the state of California. Thank, thank you for that distinction. I appreciate that. Um, and while we're talking about the criminal justice system in total and um, you know how people enter it, et cetera, I'm just gonna po pose another question to, for all of the panelists um, regarding the system and how the system um, affects people's um, desires and decisions. So San Diegans enter the criminal justice system at the point of arrest. The ACLU's recent Campaign Zero report found that in San Diego, Black and Latino people and people with mental disabilities or perceived as gender nonconforming were more likely to be stopped, searched, arrested, and to have force used against them. So I'm, I just want to know how this bias affects um, not only the charging decisions, and how they are formulated, but also the decision um, whether or not to go to trial or, or to you know, risk that given the degree of um, racism that's been found in San Diego and the system. Who would like to um, share with us their point of view on that? Well, David? Say, um, the report you mentioned was about uh, stops and encounters with police. Uh, it did not as far as I know, document any data uh, or statistics as to charging decisions. That's true, right. That is the point where people enter the criminal well, I think that, system. you know, without data on race or ethnicity of people that the district attorney's office uh, charges or declines to charge compared to the cases that are given to them by the police, uh, and I don't know that we have data on that. I will let others speak to that. Um, you know, they, they, uh, I just want to make sure that, but I will say that obviously, you know, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, the cases that the district attorney charges are based on the cases given to them by the police and sheriffs. And so that's, you know, without, without imputing any bias to the DA one way or the other, without data to inform that question, there's bias baked into it because they're getting a bias set of charges. Uh, or bias, uh, there's bias baked in the population that is given to the DA to decide whether to charge in the first place. You know, and, and, and whether, the, I'm not saying it's even necessarily intentional bias, but there is bias baked in that system and inequality and disparity baked into the population. Anyone else? Thank you so much, Mr. Loy. And I, I would like to second what Mr. Loy said about how cases come to us and it's important that people understand that we we only we get cases that are presented to us by the law enforcement agencies and so and really what I think the question goes to is about policing and the over policing of communities and how policing is done more so than um, how they how the results are and as it relates to plea bargaining. Thank you. Really quick Lori sure. I've had a conversation with Mr. Woodley before he's in our community he's talking to give him um, and we need to acknowledge that and when he initially told me that, I went back and I thought about that for a little bit. And I, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I believe that the district attorney has the power to change systemic racism by refusing, once they see a pattern, refusing to charge people in, or, or, or using some of the, 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 tech, the advances that Chessa is using in San Francisco by, by by forcing them to, to use blind charging, I believe, or blind filing and different mechanisms of that sort. And maybe I'm too radical for Woodley, but I'm saying if you see that there's institutional racism, don't charge them and the police will stop. Don't pick up the charges until you see that they're fair. If it's particularly if they're drug charges and they're not public safety issues, let's start there. And that's where a lot of the bleeding is happening or, or um, resisting arrest charges, which we're seeing a lot of also. Mr. Woodley, would you would you like to respond to that? Yes, I, 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 
I, I, once again, I would say, and I don't, I would take issue with Ms. Aziz that drug charges are, don't impact public safety. We have fentanyl being delivered across our borders every day, being distributed in our communities with young people dying from overdoses every day. And so um, drug charges do impact public safety and they're important. Um, and our role is to, uh, is to, you know, maintain public safety and prosecute cases that are presented to us. If, 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 uh, if someone has committed a crime and we have evidence to uh, support that charge, that is our responsibility to, to prosecute that. Now, ultimately, what ultimately happens to that person? Can we divert that person out of the system? Can we put that per give that person opportunities for diversion or specialty courts? Yes, those are things that we obviously um, have been doing. We, we can all do more as a system. Um, but if a person commits a crime and we have the evidence and elements to, to, to prove that, we're going to we're going to prosecute that case. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. Ms. Humphrey. I think just the, the last point on that, though, is is that the, and, and not speaking for Ms. Aziz, she does a great job on her own, the, the problem is the skewed number of cases that are coming to the DA's office don't include all the uh, uh, people who are not of color, that is, my skin tone, who may be breaking laws without the scrutiny that the police give communities of color. And so that the, you know, there may be just as many or more, who knows, uh, crimes being committed by white folks in San Diego County, but they are not brought before the uh, district attorney. And I think that's, that's kind of the, um, I think the conundrum uh, with law enforcement, and I'm not suggesting that the DA needs to send out its own investigators uh, to various other communities. I'm just suggesting that it is a skewed system. And until we address the fact that it is a skewed system, we're not gonna make as much progress as I know we all want to. Thank you. And to that point, uh, several of you have alluded, and we actually have a couple of questions regarding this um, from our attendees, um, regarding what I'll call best practices. I think Mrs. Z's alluded to San Francisco's um, practices. I think Mr. Woodley um, referenced New York's um, plea bargaining situation and arraignment um, situation. So uh, the question from the attendees is, what are best practices and what are we doing here in San Diego to um, find them and implement them in our own criminal justice system here as it re um, in regards to plea bargaining. One of the best practices, let me turn on my video. This is only because before I came to Pillars, um, my work was with youth offenders and workforce development and recidivism. So one of the best practices is attacking um, recidivism within the criminal justice system. And within that, those best practices um, look at evidence that points at, and this has been done through random assignment, meaning certain, this is the strongest evidence that you can have. A lot of the stuff that we're seeing is quasi, like Narcotics Anonymous is not evidence-based, but in our court system, people are mandated to do it. Drug treatment is evidence-based. Um, locking up a drug offender is not evidence-based. Drug treatment is evidence-based. Those are best practices. Not putting a person in the system with a multidisciplinary team of psychiatrists and drug treatment professionals and cognitive behavioral professionals and, and, and individualizing instead of this cookie cutter that we have with quasi kind of different interventions. That's how you bring best practices. There are some best practices that I'm seeing the district attorney utilize in our court systems, but it's overall, and this is what the prison and why they're struggling with recidivism and their programming, it's not based on this evidence. It's based on quasi things that people believe. Bail is, a judge saying you should have this much bail or this much bail is not an evidence-based best practice. May I, may I respond? Thank you. Because one, one, one of the things that we are doing um, uh, more so, even DAs across the country are using data to help make policy decisions. And I think as to, to go directly to your question, one of the areas that Summer has uh, since taken over as DA that um, she has um, made one of her specific directives is the prevention of crime. The way we, peep, way we keep people out of the system completely is spending more resources in helping people prevent crime from happening in the first place, whether that's job skills, educational opportunities. Those are the things that we can do to keep people out of the system that I think ultimately will lower our, our impact in those communities. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, I have a question here that I'm looking for. Um, this is for you, Mr. Woodley, um, from a, one of our attendees. You talked about how your process works and how you believe it is fair and protects public safety. Um, would you please address how the prosecutorial system could be adjusted or changed to prevent the kinds of unfairness um, that the other speakers have referenced? Well, one of the things that I think that um, everybody should do, I mean, and I know we, when Summer took office, the very first training that she had for all, all DA employees was on implicit bias. And, and that is to make sure that people understand throughout the whole process, from the touching of a file, from the first time we touch a police report to the very end of the case, are we um, making sure that the process is fair from the beginning to the end? We have to remember we're all human beings. We all have different, different uh, aspects and things that are important to us. And we have human beings working within the system. And um, so in order to make sure that people are operating fairly, uh, making sure that people, uh, as we go through the process, that we're using those th that perspective and that lens. And as it relates to how we, not only the cases that we charge, um, how we resolve cases, um, how we treat people uh, for probation violations, um, throughout that whole process. I mean, that is a focus of her, of her uh, agenda here as the DA, and that's something that she is doing and, and we are continuing to do to make sure that we make the changes. Now, I would say this to you, you know, this is me speaking, I'm not speaking for our office, but this is my personal opinion. Um, you know, we all have to look at our system and the history of our system and understand that it has not treated all our communities fair. Um, I just want to tell the story. Um, I, I sometimes sit up here on the 13th floor and I sometimes I take a walk down to the courtroom and I walked in a courtroom in which uh, they were handling, handling probation violations. And I'm sitting in the back of the courtroom. There's nobody else in the courtroom but me, the judge, the defense attorney, the defendant, and the prosecutor who was handling the case. And I'm sitting back just listening. And they were, and they were dealing with a, a gentleman who has, was before the court for probation violation. Um, he had had his probation violated once before. But it was violated because he had failed to report to his probation officer. And I'm listening to the case, and I'm listening to the probation recommend that this young man go to prison. Um, the DA stands up and argues to go to prison, and the judge, um, defense attorney, argues to try to give him another shot on probation. And the court ultimately just sent that man um, to prison for that violation for failing to report. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what impact on public safety did that case have by sending that young man to prison? How did we help um, increase public safety by sending him to prison for failing to report? And I walked out of the courtroom, and as I was walking out of the courtroom, his sister was coming in, and I was telling her, she asked me, was this case being heard? And I talked to her, and she, she went on to tell me the story that her brother, who was the defendant that just, that case had been heard, was, um, she works full time, and that he stays home and watches her kids while she's at work, trying to support their family. And the reason he didn't report was because he had to be at home for her to watch her kids while she went to work to take care of the family. And so one of the things that we have to do as a system is try to make sure that the things that we're doing, the decisions we're making, are really impacting public safety. Or are we doing things because that's what we've always done as a system? We've got to change that mindset. And to me, if, if, if there's one thing that I would say that we need to do is that sort of thing, to make sure that the decisions we're making for the right reasons and not because that's something we've always done, that we really are doing it for the right reasons. Sending someone to prison for failing to report when they haven't committed a new crime, to me, it just doesn't seem right. And that's something that we are changing and working on the change. Uh, and I think that's something we all should do within the system. And that's my only personal thing I would just like to, to convey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. Um, I appreciate that. And this question kind of follows that somewhat. It's from an attendee who has asked that um, perhaps Ms. Humphrey and Ms. Aziz could um, discuss a counter narrative of um, racial disparities and plea bargaining in San Diego. And um, to kind of tag along to what Mr. Woodley just said, perhaps offer a solution to some of the plea bargaining policies to make them more fair and more just and more, um, you know, unbiased racially. Mrs. Caesar, Ms. Humphrey, one of you want to take that? Um, I know um, all of the, one of the things is pre-trial detention. 
and allowing people. We know that um, specific groups are, are more harshly charged. Another, and I believe, I, I very much respect with what Mr. Woodley's talking about with the research. Um, that's what we do. We do a lot of research. Um, we, we look at where the issues are, where they started. Um, there are some issues with law enforcement that begin this whole process because they're the first ones who establish probable cause. They're the first ones who make the arrest. Um, they're also the ones who are doing the racial profiling but they don't have the power to file those charges. So the district attorney and the city attorney with misdemeanors in central in the central area have to be complicit in what they're doing in order for these things to move. So I believe that with these three stakeholders, um, that is where the importance is. I believe keeping as many people out of, and I'm glad that I'm hearing this, out of misdemeanors and certain felonies um, with stronger diversion. And many times I believe, and this is, and this is something I've approached the DA about before, and some of the crimes that we think are horrific are not. I'm seeing a lot of petty theft charges that are being um, aggravated, aggravated petty theft, that means you snatched your arm and you stole Tylenol, that are being um, charged as robberies. That's a trend that we're seeing when we're looking at um, our public records requests we're pulling from the DA and pulling from the court system. And those are being pled out before prelim and on probable cause. And that's a violent crime and it's a strikeable offense. And that is not a person with an AK-47 going into a bank saying everybody get down. But that's what we're dealing with. And, and those are things that we wanna modify. We're seeing these juveniles that are getting, a lot of black kids are getting strikes in our juvenile system. And we're seeing the implications later. I have a kid who got a juvenile strike, a young man who got a juvenile strike because he, his cousin snatched a purse and he didn't even snatch the purse he was in his yard but his cousin went to their house and he got aiding and abetting or and which you don't have to really prove and that's another harsh one um gang laws and a lot of people are scared to touch them because we've been we've been kind of told that if you put a gang name on there the person is guilty so anytime a person is killed you'll see gang mem member killed by police but we're looking at the systemic racism that is pretty much just destroyed our community? And what are those impl implications from voting rights to economy, to families, and, and really attacking some of those things? And we're not gonna be able to do everything. And, and a lot of times we're not coming to the table because the things that are most important are not even on the table. So we're suing them <laughs> and into compliance. And we're, we're the same thing that people in the civil rights um, era had to do to vote, we're suing them. We're, we're educating folks, we're knocking on doors. And that's the way that we feel as though we're gonna be able to deal with this because it is that horrific. We have people that are never coming home who have not committed a crime and people have used gang laws to destroy their life. And I don't think that we can negotiate oppression. Thank you, Mrs. Aziz. And Ms. Humphrey, since that question was directed to both you and Ms. Aziz, would you like to add to her comments or just submit your own here? Yes. Yes, no, I, I agree with her comments. I can say that what really we need in our system is time and resources. Uh, the case that Dwayne talked about, which was like tearing me up, happens because we're in a probation violation calendar that's going next, next, next. Uh, you know, I don't know if that young man told his defender that, hey, my sister's coming, my sister's coming, wait. Um, but those kinds of things, you know, because I have no doubt if a judge heard that, there could have been a different outcome. And so that's, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think we need to, we need to boost our participation in drug court, mental, mental health court. Uh, we have uh, the a really great mental health calendar in South Bay. It should be in every court, you know, but that takes a judge to commit to it. That takes uh, both of our offices to commit to it. Uh, it takes resources and those but those courts work. Uh, we know mental health court works. We know veterans court works. We know I mean th these are things that have been studied and have some data behind them. Um, I will you know I, I think that we can't underestimate the explosion of cases with the mentally ill in our system. They are being contacted on the streets and they are in jail. It is the number one mental health provider as our sheriff will attest. Uh, is it's been growing since the 1970s again um, and so there has to be an earlier and better way to get these folks out of the system getting uh, with their um, uh, adding a, a conviction onto their already troubled plate 
uh, does nothing to make them more eligible for whatever is out there for them. It does nothing to keep them in treatment or on medication. Uh, and it just really is a, a, a moral issue in our community that I think is just, I'll just say it, shameful. Um, uh, but I, I completely agree with Duane in that the, the thing that none of us like to hear is, well, that's all we've always done it. And blowing the dust off of our system is a is a step by step process. We have lots of people, um, and we all need to be moving in the same direction. It's hard to do when parole feels challenged. You know, probation's authority feels challenged. Well, you know, why shouldn't someone go to prison because they didn't come to my office? That's what they're supposed to do. And so we need to realize that there are people who need some retraining, some reorientation. And you know, if they can't handle it, maybe they need a new job because things are too slow. Our system is too slow and we're leaving people behind. And so I guess that would be my last thing to say is we need to have some accountability in these systems. We're, we're throwing a lot of money at probation and, and some other places uh, in our system and not getting you know, the bang for our buck that I, I had hoped. Um, but I can say, that the training on implicit bias is system-wide um, and most importantly is for new judges as well and that is i think going to over time again make uh, a whole lot more difference um, once we see a shift on the bench as well thank you Ms. humphrey um, so several of you of you have alluded to your history working with each other and how you see each other during your um, daily work in the criminal justice system. So this question refers to that somewhat. Um, so we refer to the criminal justice system, but that system is composed of people who must work together to negotiate the charges and sentences of other people. And these are the defendants. How did those working relationships among judges and attorneys benefit and or disadvantage defendants? And that's for anyone. Well, w one of the things that has helped me in my role as a district attorney is the, the time that I worked at the public defender's office. Um, the opportunity to work with public defenders, the opportunity to understand that job, understand the role, has helped me come to resolutions that I think, um, and also has helped me look at cases from the perspective of un understanding why sometimes, uh, why defendants do the things they do and, and how you can mitigate that um, when resolving cases. Um, so I, I think the fact that we have these relationships, the fact that we have these experiences has helped us, I think, for the most part, come to um, some just results most of the time. We don't always agree, but I think most of the time that, <laughs> that does uh, help in that process. One of the things I wanted to say, though, is I think the other thing that we can do as a system is remove some of these collateral consequences to pleas that prevent people from being successful or reintegrating, reintegrating themselves back into our community. And, I, and to me, you know, I used to be a public defender. I signed those chains of pleas for people in, where they lost their ability to get student loans, where they lost their ability to get job training. Um, and as a prosecutor, I signed those chains of pleas where you know, those, those opportunities were lost for people. And if you really think about it, I mean, what, what are we, I mean why are we taking those, those kinds of consequences away from people who want to try to turn their lives around? We're actually putting stumbling blocks in their way to prevent them from moving forward. And that's, these are the kinds of things that I think we recognize as an office, and these are the kinds of areas that we're trying to attack and change that help make you know, people have an opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have in the past. It really, it, the, the fact that I've worked in the system, I did those things without even actually thinking about how, how it impacted people in the community, I think that's an awakening I think all of us should do that work in the system. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective. And I see Ms. Humphrey would like to participate. Yes, I, I think those of us who work together, I mean, our most valuable possession is our credibility. And so if we work together day in and day out, uh, the important thing is that, you know, Dwayne knows I mean what I say, and if I'm telling him something, it's true, and vice versa. And that can only inure to the benefit of everyone involved. Um, likewise, the judges hear from us, and they want to know what's what, and we have to give them the truth. We are officers of the court. You know, my, my duty is to my client, but it's also to um, 
navigate this system in a credible way so that I don't hurt my client uh, by doing something um, that is not uh, appropriate or that is not trustworthy. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I agree 110% on the collateral consequences. The unit I'm in now assists people afterwards. I'm helping people expunge their records, get certificates of rehabilitation, correct their DOJ records. I have several clients who the, the DOJ had that they were convicted of felonies and they weren't, they were misdemeanors. And so then they knew, oh my gosh, I know why I'm not getting that job now. Uh, we have people leaving the, the prison without an ID. And that little thing, we all know how great it is to go to the DMV. Why would anyone walk out of a prison or a jail for that matter without appropriate ID issued by the state of California? That's a no brainer. Uh, and that it, it helps people get a job and move on. And last, I will say we are addressing is fees and fines, court order fees and fines. I, I represent indigent folks. They can't afford that and support their families and do all the other things that are expected of them. And so uh, right now they're being, I think that the latest I read on my uh, listserv is that they're being suspended. But my hope is, is that we will have a very uh, hard look at the fees and fines that are imposed because they're not collected. I think what 8% maybe is the last thing I saw are collected by the state of California. We spend way more money, way more money chasing money. Uh, and this holds people back. And I'm not, just so we know, I'm not talking about victim restitution, uh, restitution going directly to people who are harmed by the actions of someone who pleads, but I'm talking about, you know, court services fees, this fee, that fee, you know, all those add up to the thousands and thousands of dollars for people who are homeless. Uh, and that prevents them from reentering society, which is, again, the goal we all have. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, Mrs. Aziz, Mr. Loy, would you like to chime in on that question or should we just move forward? Mr. Loy? I'll pass, I'd like to add to those okay, okay. thoughts. All right. Um, okay, so um, earlier in this discussion, Mr. Woodley did allude to um, some of the changes that are being uh, made in the criminal justice system in light of the per current pandemic and the restrictions it has imposed on us as a society, but we have a question here um, from one of our attendees to just elaborate on that and to um, discuss changes happening in the plea bargain aspect of criminal justice that are perhaps um, being negotiated differently due to this pandemic and perhaps maybe even could be um, moved forward and used as a model for re reforming the plea bargain system here um, in San Diego and the penal system here. And so the question is specific to the COVID pandemic and how we are, you know, keeping our citizens and our residents um, safe during this pandemic and keeping them from um, coming in contact with um, this disease and others who might have it in the criminal justice system. So what, what we, the, the difference in the, pro, the process is that the court has been closed, which means a normal, normally the prosecutor and defense attorney uh, meet with the judge and discuss a particular case and have a plea bargain uh, discussion during the course of readiness in the judge's chambers. Since the court is now closed, those discussions are still going on, but they're, they're being done telephonically. And so we are negotiating cases. We are still trying to resolve cases. Um, just we don't have the judge's involvement in that process that we had before. And sometimes there are, there are plenty of cases during this process that we have agreed to resolve, and then there's the cases that haven't been able to be resolved. So we are still resolving and looking at cases from the same perspective, uh, trying to be fair, but also um, looking to maintain public safety as well. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to participate in that? Okay, I have a question here from um, an attendee for Ms. Humphrey. If you were put in charge of making the kinds of changes that would make the plea bargaining process more fair, what would be your top three priorities for initiating the process of change? And I know that you've already discussed some of those in a, a previous answer, but if you would just like to um, refresh us on maybe your top three changes. Um, I think, 
that the let's see i think my my theme here has been more humane time frames and the ability to obtain information to counsel to learn more about my client before i can really give a legitimate uh advice to them um you know many are straightforward but many are not and so i think our system we've gotten so obsessed with time and getting things done quickly uh, that I think we've kind of sometimes can lose sight of the human beings involved. And so that would be my wish uh, is to have more time with my clients and to evaluate the case. Um, I think we've talked about getting rid of cash bail. Uh, I think that, or, uh, I think that would go a long way to getting rid of the people who do plead just to get out. Um, that in, and in the misdemeanor realm, what that would look like would be never being in jail in the first spot or never being charged. I mean, the, the, for another day, and I know Mr. Loy knows this very well, we have so many misdemeanors, so many things that have been criminalized and so many little detailed, you know, uh, pitfalls for people that, you know, we've, we've, in my view, over criminalized. So not having those things filed in the first spot would be great. Um, but I think what I hope the current climate is really teaching us, I think number one change is for people to be engaged and to understand like, hey, this is your system. You know, wake up 90 plus percent are pleading every year. Uh, all that power is in your local district attorney. Pay attention to your district attorney race. Pay attention to your sheriff race. Listen to what they have. Uh, to say about improving our system, particularly regarding system, systemic racism, and vote accordingly. Um, I mean, that's, that's our power, is to make the changes we want to see in the system. Um, and, you know, I, what I would want to hear uh, from, uh, you know, any candidate is how they plan to charge things. Am I just going to plan, you know, I hear uh, district attorneys, not Mr. Woodley, tell me, well, it's charged that way because that's what he did. Well, that's not necessarily what needs to happen for justice to be done. And so I would like to know that there's a more thoughtful approach to what is charged in the first place, what allegations are added, what uh, you know, priors are added, and what other allegations, particularly gang allegations, are added. Are those all necessary, again, in this particular case to see justice done or not? and how as a, as a district attorney, I would view that. Um, and I, and, you know, and a corollary to that is uh, that it has to trickle down to the rank and file. Um, we, we are hopefully entering a new, more thoughtful phase of prosecution and defense, and it has the, the top um, plans that are made um, by Ms. Summers and others need to get all the way down to the people who are dealing with all the cases. Because, uh, you know, certainly those messages uh, can get a little changed in the negotiation room. And so all those things, I think, are, are very important for, and I, and I hope um, our community is awakened while we have this extra time to think about it, um, to, uh, to get more engaged locally. Locally is where it's at. That's where everything happens. I'd like to highlight what, uh, uh, just a footnote on what Ms. Humphrey said and, and draw into something that Ms. Aziz said earlier. Speaking of so-called gang enhancements, it's very easy to hear the word gang and think, oh my God, as Ms. Aziz said, people with AK-47 spraying bullets in the street. And you know, anyone who sprays an AK-47, you know, that person needs to be prosecuted. I, I, I'm fine with that. But the very definition of who is in a gang under the Cal gang system and based on the, the statutory criteria and regulations are ridiculously arbitrary and subjective. It's very much in the eye of the beholder. And it literally does boil down to, you know, who a police officer thinks is in a gang or not based on who you happen to be standing next to on a street corner at any given time of day, and especially uh, for communities of color. Um, so um, both that charging practice and that document documentation practice and the very existence of those laws are, um, create immense leverage and immense potential for abuse uh, that I think is a systemic policy reform that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Loy. Um, okay, I just have a, we're 
we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I just want to try to get to another couple of questions that have come in. Um, one kind of piggybacks on what you were speaking about, Ms. Humphrey, and all of us here today have discussed regarding the system and how it operates and how we as a society interact with that system. And so this question is specifically about the um, financial resources we devote to the criminal justice system, specifically in the prosecutor's office versus the defense, op you know, the defense attorneys, um, and how citizens and voters should or could participate in making sure that's um, equitable. So um, for, maybe we'll start with you, Mr. Woodley, about the allocation of resources to these two offices and how those resource allocations ultimately affect us as residents here in San Diego. Well, I mean, I, I think both, of, both our offices are funded by the County Board of Supervisors. Um, they determine through a budget process who, what, what, alle what resources are allocated. Um, I don't think we have any impact on what the public defender's budget is. I mean, they make their own request to the Board of Supervisors and we do the same. I think one of the differences between our, so that the public understands, is that we review all of the cases that um, where an individual is arrested. Um, we do not charge every case that is presented to us. And therefore, because we're touching more of the cases in the system, I think that is part of the inequity in the budget process because the public defender only gets the cases that we issue potentially, um, but not all of the cases that we, we have to process and review, um, investigate, and then ultimately issue. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. Ms. Humphrey, you probably would like to participate. Yes, I'm, I, yes, uh, I think we, the, the rule of thumb, I think is that we get two thirds of their budget because, you know, private attorneys and other attorneys uh, uh, handle some cases, but, and we do not have uh, charging uh, responsibility, but there's another aspect to funding, I think, um, and, and main, to the district attorney's office, and that is criminal justice money that comes from federal grants, that comes from uh, money that is taken from uh, people when they're arrested, uh, civil uh, monies that are taken, uh, and, and these grants often, in, in that, you know, I think is a lion's share uh, in, increase in the, in the DA's budget. And so they're, instead of being just a third bigger than ours, it's much bigger. Um, that's number one. Number two, a lot of these grants have unintended consequences. They have benchmarks. You know, there need to be X number of prosecutions or X number of uh, convictions. Uh, I saw this uh, much to my dismay in the, you know, long ago in the um, welfare fraud cases and what was expected in, in those grants um, that was counterproductive to uh, seeing uh, these women charged go back to their lives and be able to, you know, uh, get their rights back and to be able to rejoin society and the workforce. And so, you know, the uh, insurance uh industry gives money to the district attorney and they certainly expect some prosecutions to happen and and there's drug money that comes from the federal government you know so there's there's a lot of other funding for the the prosecutor that we do not have um and so that is the and and not to mention uh they have the resources of police sheriff uh federal law enforcement etc uh that can work their cases for them um that are not paid by them that are paid by other agencies, whereas we have investigators, we have social workers, we have other people who work with us who are quite, quite capable and well-trained, um, but you know, it certainly isn't uh, everyone. That's why it's great to get help uh, from communities um, regarding our clients and, and certainly uh, lawyers welcome that uh, assistance. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a David and Goliath thing, but let me just step back and say one thing also. We would hope that most of the people, all the people who are charged should be done in a, in a way that, you know, makes us as a society um, feel comfortable. And we hope um, that our law enforcement gets it right, our district attorney gets it right, you know, a huge percentage of the time. Otherwise, we're doing something really wrong. And so the fact that a lot of people plead in and of itself is not necessarily indicative of a bad or uh, a system that is just is in shambles. 
but rather we want to make sure that the people who are arrested and who are pleading, you know, charged and then are pleading, um, you know, are done, are done so appropriately and to fix what has been a systemic problem, again, racism, um, and make sure that, you know, that's where we're going. And so, uh, you know, it, it, on the one hand, we have to acknowledge, you know, the David and Goliath, but on the other hand, we also have to say that many people, and we see this with body-worn cameras, uh, it, it, the cases are borne out on video. And so, and some aren't, and those are dismissed. And so things like that, I think, have really injected uh, some responsibility and some accountability into our system, and, and I applaud that too. I'll just say very briefly, if I may, in terms of funding inequities, and I've not been a defender for a while, so I'll defer to those who've done it more, more recently than I have, but, and I don't, with no disrespect to district attorneys, but they get their cases handed to them on a silver platter, more or less. The police, the sheriff, investigate, work it up, hand it over. They may do some additional reinvestigation, but by the time a defense counsel gets it, whether a private, private counsel or public defender, right, they have to reinvestigate that case from the ground up. They cannot afford, a, a, a proper zealous defense can't afford to take anything for granted. And that's not just reinvestigating the facts of what happened and re-interviewing witnesses and tracking things down, which often will uncover the fact that witnesses have not told the truth to the police. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been an investigator and a defense counsel, and I, that's happened to me. I've gone out, I've interviewed witnesses, and they're like, it's not what I told the officer. And whether they're lying to me or lying to the officer, I have to re-interview re that witness, right? Then, the, and there's beyond the facts of the case, there's investigating the whole life history of the client, because as others have said, you know, there's much more to the charge than just the who, what, when, where, and how of what happened on the day in question. And whether you're talking about uh, exculpatory evidence or evidence in mitigation or uh, a package to present or reduction of charges or diversion or what have you, it's, it's structurally 10 times more difficult for the defense to reinvestigate that. And so you can't just look at the numbers of cases and say, well, the defender should only get two thirds of the budget of the DA. Thank you, Mr. Loy. Mr. Woodley, um, the other panelists here today, including Ms. Humphrey and Ms. Aziz, have called into question and um, asked about or alluded to the performance metrics um, in you know, the DA department and um, the allocation or the um, collection of resources and funding, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I would like to give you a chance to just um, allude to that or discuss it or rebut it um, since it's come up a couple of times now about how your office operates and the monies that it receives to operate and how the um, perhaps the people in your office are evaluated in their performance. Well, there's, there, there's no doubt that we do receive grants um, from either insurance industry, the insurance uh, and other uh, entities that uh, help us uh, prosecute cases. And, and all, with any kind of grant, there's always um, results and data that you have to provide as a result of receiving that money. Um, some of those have to do with cases. Some of those have to do with, um, uh, you know, reduction in crime and things of that nature. So um, that is a, a portion of uh, the monies that we receive that's outside of what we get from the Board of Supervisors necessarily that we do receive in order to do our job. But that's the, those are grants that are, exist in the world and that are available to us to help us do our jobs and they also employ people and um, and I would say you know the thing is I, I would echo the things that Mr. Loy said and, and Ms. Humphrey said as it relates to defending defendants I understand that process I, I did it I understand what it takes and what we have to do and I think one of the things that makes it even more important now is we're looking at the whole person more in the criminal justice system than we ever did um, Previously, we just looked at what the charge was and what the person did. And now, with mental health issues, with the drug addiction issues, and things of that nature, it does require a little bit more information about the defendant um, as part of this process now that we all need in order to make the most informed and just a decision. So, um, but, you know, I do think that, that those uh, funding issues uh, should be increased for everybody that's in the system um, for, those, for those purposes. Thank you, Mr. Woodley. So with this is going to be our last question. Um, I want to thank you all for participating. And this question goes 
to all of you if you'd like to answer, but specifically I'm going to address it to Mrs. Aziz because she is a, a member and a, helps run an organization, a community organization, grassroots like the League of Women Voters. So um, I'm going to start with you, Mrs. Aziz, and then the others of you can chime in if you uh, would, would like to. So the question is, what role do you think organizations like the League of Women Voters can play in bringing about the changes that we've all discussed and talked about here today to make plea bargaining more fair? One of the aspects is I invite anyone to come and, and participate in our court watch program. And doing that, you'll see a lot of where the plea bargaining happens. happens. Um, and you'll also see the disparities in different courts. You'll see where, where Dwayne really is, which is downtown. So you'll see some differences on how East County and South County can sometimes be cowboys in the system and do some really harmful things. But just being there and witnessing that. Another one is in the expungement clinics that we do. And that's how I met Ms. Humphrey. You'll see a lot of the pain there with the plea bargaining that went into and how these people's lives are now um, altered forever. And how certain things like those fines and fees that have nothing to do with victims, um, restitution, how those are stopping people. And we're actually calling these people and um, right now because of COVID. And we're, we're seeing how did it go with your expungement. I, I mean, the public defender's office should be applauded and they should be given grants in order to help clear people's records. Um, let's look at where some of this money is going. And, and public records requests, Freedom of Information Acts. The DA, I send one to them at least weekly. And I've learned, I've, I have some ideas on some new ones to send from today. Some of the, the responses that are going on, but open and a transparent America, we all deserve that. And, and sometimes we follow the leads lead um, because civic engagement is something that you guys have been doing for over a hundred years. And us having low propensity voters now who are, 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 are registered to vote and, and who are in power within their community to hold politicians accountable, that's something. So cross is something also and and building with people you might not look exactly like as far as your mission and different things but you share similarities and seeing that where you can be allies and working together from trust and authenticity thank you i appreciate that does anybody else have any advice for the league and league members on how we can make this a more just system i will say i would only add oh sorry you no, you'll go ahead julia <laughs> <laughs> uh, lawyers interrupting each other. Um, I would only say that uh, that I think this is a great thing to educate oneself. Um, I do recall there used to be a lot more people who would come to court and watch. Um, you know, in, in the post-COVID uh, environment, it's tough to, you know, tell people, especially older folks, to go to court. Uh, I include myself in that. Uh, but it is eye-opening to see justice. It is, and, and I used to say hello when I was a new lawyer to people who would be there every day and would see what was going on and, and would make comments to me about, about cases. And it was, really was more of a community feeling. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would encourage you to get engaged with your local courthouse and check it out and see what's what and, you know, ask questions. Why did that happen? You know, what's that about? Um, or call the offices if you saw something you didn't like on, you know, on either side or the judge, whoever. It, it's important for us to, to know, I mean, these are, we talk about these things like they're the bedrock of our society, and they are. Our, our justice system separates us from so many, you know, and, and, and I don't want that lost in a critique, but we have to be aware and know and protect it in a real way, not just in kind of a, you know, kind of it's there for other people. It's there for all of us. Thank you, really good point, Mr. Uh, I, yeah, I just add one real quick. I, I think that forums like this are really important for everybody to become educated, especially when you have participants in all parts of the system participating in them. And I would also say that the more knowledge you have, the more understanding you have of the system. Um, we have uh, websites that talk about, our website has information about what we're doing. Um, I welcome and offer my opportunity for uh, us to come speak to any group or any organization uh, about what we're doing and what we have been doing. You're right, transparency is important and understanding. One of the things that I realized going out and talking to people, I get this response from people all the time. I didn't know you guys did this. I didn't know you guys did that. There's a lot of things that we do that I don't think a lot of people are aware of that are impacting the criminal justice system. And, and those are just some resources to get that. But I think, you know, getting get more information and getting knowledgeable will really help. 
Thank you, Mr. Woodley. And finally, Mr. Loy, I appreciate I your be, patience. Oh, no, not at all. I, I think everyone else is much better informed than I am about these issues. And so I welcome their thoughts. Um, I will say only that um, connection, compassion, empathy, and proximity. Um, for those of us who have had the privilege of not being severely impacted by the uh, criminal system, whether as witnesses, uh, defendants, um, complainants, victims, you know, it's, it's easy to put that world in a box and say, that's got nothing to do with me. You know, I only see that on TV, it's nothing to do with me. And, you know, if I've had that privilege, I'm blessed. Um, but I would encourage connection, compassion, empathy, and proximity, digitally or otherwise. Uh, you know, it may not be possible to do it in person these times, but read the accounts of people who have been impacted by this system. Understand, try, exert your ability to have compassion, empathize with their lived experience. Uh, everyone has been impacted by the system. And then from that grounding, become engaged, do continue to what you're doing now, become engaged, and then, you know, join with others. Each of us, none of us individually will make a difference. It is only by collective action and joining with colleagues and community partners that we will be able to do the great work that it, others on this call have already done. I, I'm just a litigator. I'm not, I'm not a policy advocate. I'm not an organizer. I'm not a, a, you know, a politician. There are many, many people doing great work in communities, and I encourage you to have connection, compassion, and proximity with those people and join with the people doing that work to build social change. Thank you. Great advice from everyone. I appreciate your feedback on this. Um, speaking of feedback, we're going to probably try to reach out to the attendees and see if we can get some um, of their perspective on how this went. This is our first one, and I want to thank you all for attending. I want to specifically thank our um, panelists, uh, local activist Le Leila Aziz, public defender Juliana Humphrey, ACLU legal director David Loy, and chief deputy district attorney Dwayne Woodley for your time today and your very thoughtful responses. I really feel like we've gotten a lot of knowledge and information about your perspectives on this call and I look forward to particip participating again with you in other upcoming events that we that we do as the league. So thank you all and have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs>